that she'd woken up. She felt hope. She felt like it was a sign that she wasn't meant to die because for everything that she took, she should have. Um, and yeah, she was gonna gonna get help and, and carry on. Hello and welcome to the Truth, Lies and Workplace Culture podcast, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. My name is Leanne, I'm a business psychologist. My name is Al, I'm a business owner. We are here to help you simplify the science of people and create amazing workplace cultures. Welcome, welcome. You might have heard that I've now got the cold that Leanne had <laughs> last week. You're still a little bit rough, aren't you, love? I am a little bit, yeah. I think I'm still a bit deeper in my voice than I normally am. Yeah, and I and I I'm just sound like oh, like I'm holding my nose, bunged up, oh, bunged up. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. But um, I don't think it's COVID. And also, we were saying we're quite lucky because we're going to um, we're going to London. To, well, we're setting off tomorrow, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And so with us already having a cold, we're hoping that we're not going to pick anything else up in London. Yeah, uh, the immune system is fighting and yeah, on form. Hopefully, hopefully. oh, but come back with COVID. <laughs> oh, that would be disastrous but anyway worse things have happened so lee we're going to do a slightly different version today aren't we we are we have no guests uh leanne we don't. Can, yeah <laughs> no we do have plenty of guests people who will you know who, who, who we're waiting to put on the pod mm. but um today we're going to talk a little bit about our personal story around mental health uh just to give it a context lee why have we decided to do that well today day of recording is world mental health day and the theme is this year is how mental health is a human right. It's about trying to break down inequity within mental health services to make sure everybody can experience positive mental health. And I think it's one of those things that we talk about a lot on the podcast. We talk about mental health, we talk about well-being. You might be thinking, who are you to mm -hmm. sit and chat about this? Um, and the, I guess the answer is nobody really, but we will tell you a bit about our backgrounds and a bit about our experience with mental health and well-being and why we are so passionate about it. And hopefully share a bit more about us. We talk about authenticity and vulnerability and leadership. We have to do the same as well. And it's been a while since we've opened up. I think it's almost a year ago, isn't it? I think it's December last year that Al and I released our individual episodes um, about our, our career history. So yeah, go back and listen to that if you're interested. But this is going to be a bit more, a bit more personal. Yeah, so um, I, th I think let's just start by setting the scene for, for new listeners, perhaps, or old listeners, or not old, but existing <laughs> listeners um, who perhaps have heard about us before. We had a podcast, uh, we started a podcast about four years ago around travel. Ten years ago, we left the UK and started traveling full time. We've been professionally unemployed, uh, not unemployed, professionally homeless, <laughs> and I suppose unemployed, <laughs> professionally homeless for uh, for about 10 years now, uh, maybe coming up 11. Uh, traveled around Europe, lived in, I think, almost every single country in, in mainland Europe. Uh, we've also been to the East, we've been to India, we've been lots of different places. And so on paper, people, I, I'm sure people who we know us think, oh, you, you lucky bastards, look at that. It's, you've got the perfect life. And we want to be open up a little bit about that and say, no, aspects that aren't perfect. And we have the same challenges as if we were sitting in the UK in the rain. So um, we're going to open up a little bit about that, aren't we, Lee? Yes. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our sort of... Um, our backgrounds, uh, how we how we've sort of got to where we are today, and the mental health struggles we've had, pr uh, each of us within that as well. You'll notice that Leanne's is skewed a little bit more towards. I'm not saying corporate, but towards employment because you were employed up until about six years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. Whereas my last job was 2002, and it was uh, it was selling advertising space, um, which was a bit of a dodgy dodgy company actually. Thinking about it, um, so uh, I've been self employed since then. So, Lee, where do you want to start? Should we start about how we met, maybe? Mm. A bit of a glimpse into, I guess, in a way, how we've both cared about mental health and well-being for a long time and independently. Um, yeah, should we start there? Yeah. So do you want to tell the story? You tell it. Okay, so both of us, uh, this was back in about 2007, I think, when we first met, maybe 2006, um, we were both volunteering for a, a charity in the UK called Samaritans. Now, if you're from the UK, you'll probably have a good idea what it is. If you're not from the UK, then I think the US and Australia have something very similar. The idea is if someone, if a member of the public is in distress or despair or have uh, suicidal, sorry, suicidal thoughts, then they can lift a phone and they can dial this number and it's anonymously talk to someone. And the whole point of Samaritans is we're not there to talk you out of ending your life if that's what you want to do. We want to talk to you about what it would be like if you ended your life. Um, like if you rung your mum and you said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about killing myself, your mum would react in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. She'd be like, oh my God, don't do this. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm coming around, I'm coming around, I'm calling the police, whatever. If you ring the Samaritans, think about sending, then you say, I think about ending my life. Then the Samaritans would go, 
okay, so I mean, what brought you to this point? And what do you think death would be like? Um, and all this kind of thing. So the whole point is that you get someone who's going to actually just talk to you without panicking and calling ambulance and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, without judgment. And, and the core belief of Samaritans is self-determination. So if you decide that that is the best option for you, then you have the right to make that decision, which can sound, I think a lot of people can't really wrap their heads around that when it comes to Samaritans and particularly other mental health practitioners I've worked with in the past. Some of them aren't a big fan of Samaritans mm. for that that reason. But I think from Alan and I's experience, what tended to happen was, you know, that that very extreme situation where somebody was in the process of killing themselves while we talked to them was very, very rare. Most of the time people are calling up because they're, they're confused and they're scared and they're feeling hopeless and they just need somebody to talk to and somebody to, to talk about these dark thoughts and feelings without that judgment and without that reaction. And often that in itself can be a huge relief and a huge weight. And then the mind can clear and start to be a bit more objective. Um, so yeah, the, the extreme case is rare, but that is in fact how Al and I met. Yeah, so um, Leanne was there. She's Leanne's a lot younger than me, seven years younger than me. Uh, but she was kind of like my supervisor there because she was a bit more experienced. And so I was, I was still on probation. We were doing this overnight shift, which is 11 p.m. till 7 a.m. Um, and there's two of us in the room. And people think Samaritans might be this bank. It's not. It's just individual rooms around the country. And there was just two of us on and in that particular room on that particular night. About four o'clock in the morning, I took a call from a lady who, and obviously I'm going to generalize this because obviously Samaritans, the whole point is confidentiality. This lady who was describing her life and saying that she wanted to end it. And she started taking, so taking overdose of pills. So obviously I put my hand up to Leanne because I'm like, you know, I need a little bit of guidance on this. You're the more experienced one. So Leanne came over, listened in, um, and was like sort of giving me, suggest writing down things to ask her. Um, anyway, so to cut a quite a long call short, cause it was maybe about an hour and a half. Uh, she ended up, uh, she said she's taking more and more pills and she ended up just sort of getting quieter, more slurred, more slurred. And then for the last 10 minutes, there was just nothing. Um, and she, we, we didn't know whether she'd got, well, our assumption was she'd fall into unconsciousness, but we didn't know whether that had meant that she'd actually, you know, passed away or not. Um, the slightly thing which I think a lot of people can't get their head around is that we did manage to get her address out of her saying, look, if you do change your mind at the very last minute, we can call an ambulance. But she said, I don't want you to do that. And the very last words to her was like, I absolutely do not want you to call an ambulance. I know what I'm doing. This is it. So we were sitting there a bit like, wow, fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we, we but went and made a cup of tea, um, had a little chat about it. Um, and Leanne was like, look, you know, sometimes this happens very rare, but sometimes it happens. You just you don't know. I mean, and I, I was of the opinion that this lady's life, she was kind of right. You know, she had a horrible life. I could totally understand why she was making that decision. It was not my place. Even if I believed that she was wrong, it's not my place to talk her out of it. So that all happened. And then that was like, and usually with these calls, you never hear anything else, do you, Lee? Usually you don't know. Usually you, yeah, you, it's, it's very rare that, that you get an ending to that story, either either happy or otherwise. Um, but yeah, a couple of hours later, Al was on another call. The phone went, I picked up, and it was the same woman. Mm. And what was extraordinary about that is that this was an overnight shift, 11 p.m. till 7 a.m. Uh, the Manchester and Salford branch that we volunteered for was one of the few branches of the country that were 24 hours. So because of that, you could get calls from all over the country that would route through into into Manchester. So the mm. chance of, of getting the the same branch if you call back is very, very slim. <laughs> um, so she, But she called back. Um, she said that she had... Um, that she'd taken overdose, she'd woken up, she'd been sick, that she'd been speaking to a Samaritan early in the evening. And if there's any way of tracking down uh, the man that she spoke to, could I please tell him thank you, that he had helped massively, that she'd woken up. She felt hope. She felt like it was a sign that she wasn't meant to die because for everything that she took, she should have. Um, and yeah, she was going to gonna get help and, and carry on. And that was out. Yeah. And that just, I mean, that was the only time, it was probably... Um handful of times that happened to each one of us with a, what they call suicide in progress mm -hmm. and it was the only time for me certainly that you got any kind of like follow-up from it me too yeah so it was incredible so leanne and i were like it's seven o'clock in the morning in the middle of manchester obviously adrenaline like oh my god this is like we shared the most sort of what's the word intimate moment i suppose of someone's life i don't know whether yeah. that sounds weird yeah, yeah it is a, a, a very intimate moment yeah and so, and I knew that I really liked Leanne and um, I found subsequently that she liked me. Um, and then I was like, oh, I should ask her for a coffee. But then I thought that'd be really weird because I'm a bit older and <laughs> she's like kind of my boss, I suppose. 
So um, so we just went our separate ways. Um, but anyway, long story short, we eventually, after about another year, um, I plucked up the courage to ask her out, and uh, we went out for a drink. And then, I mean, I would say the rest is history. But I was I was a bit of a bad boyfriend for the first year, but then hopefully made up for it <laughs> for the last sixteen. I think you absolutely did. You absolutely did. But yeah, so I think that's the that's how Anne and I met, and that is, as I say, kind of a, an indication that both of us really thought that mental health was important and getting support for your mental health was important and doing that from a point fairly early on in our careers I think I was 20 you would have been 27 yeah 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 so it's so yes and we did that for five years we were Samaritans for five years Al ended up um being on the training team I was on the recruitment team we were both on the committee Al was the chair of um, Manchester and Salford Samaritans for a while Al did the prisons um yeah, there was lots and lots of different things that we did within the community as part of Samaritans. Um, and it was it was a really important part of my life, not only my career, but my well, meeting out, of course, I met my husband there. But yeah, I think it's I think that's probably the start of it all, isn't it? That mm. mental health was always something that we believed should be taken care of. Yeah. And I think the other things we learned from there was how to listen. You probably know that most people don't listen. They just wait for their turn to speak. Um, and to really listen to someone, to really learn how to listen is one of the most valuable skills you can get. And it's, I think it pervades everything. So everything, it underpins everything that we do. Our interviews, we listen. We don't talk about ourselves. Um, in terms of our consultancy, we're paid to listen. In terms of everything, we're paid to listen, listen, listen. So it has been the, for, the basis of almost every single thing we've done. So Lee, do we want to segue on to perhaps um, a scenario where your mental health wasn't quite where you'd want it to be? Yeah, I think my, I think my first experience of, I guess, realizing that that how we felt psychologically could really impact how kind of we were physically. I mean, had experiences similar to that before, and if you go back to Ellen I's episode, we talk about kind of experience I had in high school and that's how I decided to to go into psychology but I think my first kind of personal experience with it was kind of that exam season stress we all know I was I was an academic I did my A-levels I went to university um nerd I know I'm a proper nerd and I I'd never thought I was that stressed about it I was a bit worried but you know as you are um taking exams seriously but I started suffering with eczema when I was 17 I'd never had eczema before. It's usually a thing you get as a kid, isn't it? Mm. I'd never had it before. And it was everywhere. It was all up my arms, all over my chest, all down my legs, all over my stomach. It was everywhere. And it was so uncomfortable and so itchy and so painful. And I went to the doctors and I couldn't get rid of it. I was using all the creams and the washes and, and nothing would work. And then the day after my final exam, it just went away. <laughs> it just went away. And then every year when exams came around, the same would happen. It would flare up, it would go away, it would flare up, it would go away. And that was the first time that I was kind of like, wow, like physiologically, my stress is is manifested physiologically so, so bad, so much, so, so strongly. Mm. Um, I think that was my first experience, I guess, personal experience of kind of the mind-body connection and how, um, how strong that is. Yeah, it's nuts, isn't it? And... I think I think anyone who's listening to this, I'm hoping that someone's listening to this and thinking, "Oh, <laughs> oh, now I get it." I had massive. I used to get lots of really bad indigestion and stomach issues and all that kind of thing, and that was definitely down to down to stress. And um, and now I think we both of us we'd rather people say to us, "Are you busy?" We go, "No," <laughs> <laughs> because we don't want to go back to where that situation was. And, and I don't know about you, but I find every every few weeks I'm like. I don't know, I might have a sore stomach or something, and I'm like, oh, right, okay, that's my sign that I'm taking things a bit too seriously, taking myself a bit too seriously and taking too much on. Definitely, yeah. It's just a little a little, little patch of dry skin. I'm like, uh-oh. Um, but, yeah, that's probably my first one, which, which is quite mild. And then I guess my next experience after that, which was much more significant, was Al and I were in an attempted at carjacking in Manchester. Mm -hmm. Actually, on the way to do an overnight shift at Samaritans is from we were living together mm. in Oldham. Um, and I was driving and I decided to take a 
a back road route into um, into Manchester City Centre, which looking back was probably a bit daft. But even then, it was a route we'd done loads and loads mm. of times at night. It wasn't particularly dodgy or dark. And there was a car just sat there in the middle of the road. And me being naive was like, oh, I wonder what they're doing. And flashed my lights, went beep, beep. Um, and then the next minute, they were just flashing their, their lights and just driving towards us. And they hit us, didn't they, the first time? Yeah, they hit us. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> it's like rivers, rivers. But it was single track. It was dark. It was up a hill. Um, it was terrifying. So then I froze and panicked. And then a guy got out of out of the car with a baseball bat. Mm. Um, at that point, I was like, Leah, come on, you can do this drive. And I was like, oh, my God. Reverse, reverse, reverse. And then somehow, luckily, they were they kept ramming into us. Mm. And for some reason, they decided to try and ram the side of us. I'm not sure if they were trying to get our wheels or I don't know. But they ended up managing to to bump themselves to the side of the road. And at that point, we could we could floor it um, and go down. So obviously, after that, a little bit of anxiety <laughs> was felt. But it was actually a few years later, and speaking to a mental health professional, that I realized that, because um, a few years after that, I started suffering with panic attacks, quite severe panic attacks. Mm. Um, and it took me a long, long time to connect that my anxiety was trauma-induced, not post-traumatic stress disorder, but trauma-induced anxiety disorder. Um, so it is quite, it is quite cognitive. It's quite flashing lights will will trigger me, or certain scenarios will trigger me. Any sense of incongruence, not being able to make sense of the situation, I feel myself panicking. That was the the event that happened, and then subsequently, highs of stress tipped me into some pretty significant panic attacks. Mm. How did, how's that gone away? I mean, what was that just time that it's just gone away? Um, there was a few different things that I think have happened for that to go away. And I think a big one was just moving abroad. Right. And getting away from that high stress, always on mentality mm. that I was in in the UK. I had a great job and I had a very supportive manager in a very caring environment. If I'd have gone in and said I was struggling with mental health challenges, I would have been supported. They're incredible. But that didn't take away from the fact that I was a manager in a high stress performance driven role uh, with lots of people that I was responsible for um, in an environment as it's cool as Manchester is. It is very hustle. It is very competitive, even amongst your peers or people, you know, or, you know, it is a it is a it is that kind of hamster wheel thing. So I think that definitely helped, like having this segregation of of work and life and literally left the country, went to work in the UK, went to live in Spain. Um, so I think that definitely helps separate things. Um, I stopped drinking caffeine for about two years. And even now I can only have two cups of coffee maximum a day. Otherwise I can feel myself starting to vibrate. Um, eating better. I think maybe just being a bit more self-aware. So when I can... Like, you know how you were saying you find yourself, you get a bad stomach and you catch yourself and you'll start mm. to a similar thing. Like there's certain things that I experienced before it escalates to the point where I'm going to have a panic attack and that and that can take weeks or months. So things like feeling like a shortness of breath or vertigo, like feeling dizzy when I stand up, mm. um, trouble sleeping, um, yeah, insomnia and then hypersomnia when I can't wake up in the morning. So there's little things like that that I'll, I'll look out for and know. And then it's just a case of, saying no to stuff, whether that's work stuff, whether that's social stuff, making sure I've got that rest and recovery time. I I am quite introverted and I need time to build my energy levels back up. And if I don't have that for too long a period of time, then that's when I start to start to slip, I think. So how about you? Because I mean it's it was a frightening experience, but I don't think that that was one of your triggering events, was it, that contributed to some of your Challenges. No, I don't think it did. I mean, I, I have to be honest, I'm a lot more wary driving at night or of any other driver now these days. Um, but I think that you mentioned something there about the hustle, which is my trigger. And it was something which when we first met, um, I was really into Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, I was really into sort of like the hustle culture. And I was like, it's, they call it hustle porn these days. Um, and it was really into that. And I think the it was that idea that you have to get up at five, you have to get an ice bath, then you have to drink coffee with butter in it. And then, and then you go and journal, then you do all this. And then that's, what's going to make you wealthy. But you also then have to go to bed at night at 12 at night after doing 16 hour days and all that. And I followed that. I subscribed to that. I did the whole Tony Robbins walking across the coal thing. I did, you know, read all the books, the self-help books I could read. And I was like, yeah, okay, right. I'm going to make a better version of myself. 
And that just led to, it led to to some success in terms of business. Yes, I built, me and my partner, um, Chris built a property company from nothing. I was literally bankrupt when we started it. At the end of it, had a couple of million in, in equity in there. And we built that over about sort of um, 18, 19 months. But the hustle just took it out of me and took me years to recover. And looking back, I would rather, I'd rather have my life back than the actual money. And I think that the hustle, a lot of people read Twitter, they read these things and go, right, okay, this is what I need to do in order to make it. And it's like, no, that's what Gary Vaynerchuk is doing in order to make it, because Gary Vaynerchuk is probably morbidly, well, perfect phrase, morbidly afraid of dying. And so therefore he wants to fit as much as he possibly can in his life. That's Gary's way. Your way may be very, very different. The other thing to consider is that we're recording this and someone has just done, I think in the UK, has just done a almost two hour marathon. So we're 26 miles in two hours. We've worked out like four minutes and three, four minutes and three seconds per mile or something like that. It's, I think it's the fastest it's ever been done. And I want to say, look, the reason, the reason that's newsworthy is because it's uncommon. And so if you see stuff on Twitter, you see news of a 14-year-old who's made a million pounds because they built this app. It's newsworthy because it's uncommon. And so don't assume that hustle is the way you do it. There's a great quote, and I think it's Bob Dylan, but if it's not, please find us on LinkedIn, tell us who it is, who said something like, happiness can be defined as waking up in the morning, going to bed at night, and doing in, the, in between doing what you love. And I think that's it. If you find that intersection of what you're good at, what people will pay for and what you can do over an extended period of time, money just just disappears. You're not even that bothered because money will come, but more importantly, you'll wake up excited about your day rather than waking up at five and going, oh, Jesus, I, my book says I've got to go for a run now. Then I've got to go and have some coffee. Then I've got to go and meditate for 10 minutes. Then I've got to go and journal for 20 minutes. Just so I can say on Twitter, I've got more done by 7 a.m. than most people have got done by midday. You were saying there it took you years to to recover. From what? Like, how are you feeling? How are you thinking? What was that looking like? And how did you recover? I always felt if I stayed in bed past like 7 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. that I was failing and I'd ruin the day. So I'd feel that. I'd also like look at other people and go, hang on a minute, I'm turning 33. I'm not now. I'm turning 40 seven next year but i'm turning 33 and look what i've made of my life i've made nothing of my life oh my god there are people out there who who at 33 have built six businesses and now living you know in a cottage in the alps and then i just can and this comes on to another thing i'm going to talk about there i just compare myself to others and go i'm not as good as them and the reason is i'm not hustling and i think and it doesn't help because you your social media algorithms even back then once you watch one thing, you they give you more of the same. So you felt that everyone out there was hustling. And I think that's how it sort of ends. And the way I stopped it was just stopped reading those books, stopped worrying about things, said, okay, here's my to-do list of 15 things. What happens if I, how many of these can I cross off and no one's going to care? Oh, shit. I can cross off nine of them. No one's going to care. So I'll just do those top three. And how did you get out, try to undo some of that mindset? I'm not sure I've necessarily undone it. Because I still now wake up and I can't lie in bed because I feel like I'm wasting time. I was ill yesterday in bed all day and I felt really shit about it all day because I felt like I'd wasted the whole day. So I'm still, I'm sure it's still in there, but I just stop worrying about all the people thinking. I stop, I used to go on Facebook and go like sort of 6.30 a.m. I'd wake up, set my alarm and the first thing I'd go on Facebook and go, ready for another day, ready at them. And it's like, don't be a dick, Al. Don't be one of those guys. But I was one of those guys because I, I wanted the rest of the world to think that I was a hustler, even though I woke up and I was like, oh, my God, I don't want to get out of bed because there's just so much to do and so much overwhelm. And of course, it, you know, we are kind of talking from a position of privilege. There are people mm -hmm. that need to go out and do whatever job they can to earn money. I think I think even then there are and I've worked. I've, I, and again, I feel like I can say this because I've worked with people who have been long term unemployed and support them to get back into work. And I think you know, there were ways that we could find jobs that they they did enjoy or aligned with their interests in some way. Um, so I think even then there are there are options and there are choices that you can make. Mm. Um, but of course, we are talking is from a very a point of a point of privilege here, which is the whole point of World Mental Health Day this year is about addressing the the inequity. And I think that's again one thing that Al and I have always been aware of. Mm. Maybe not very very consciously but I think our actions have kind of 
over time shown that we probably have been quite aware of our privilege and we have been mm-hmm. quite aware of of addressing that and balance in some way through Samaritans. Um, Al used to go and do mentorship, didn't you? Um, for schools in with lower so- socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, I worked in welfare to work for five years, um, you know, helping people with multiple, multiple challenges. Um, so I think we've always maybe been aware of our our position of privilege um, and trying to trying to give back a little bit. And including when we've moved abroad, you know, we've tried to... Um, we try to do our bits there as well, including adopting a little little ginger puppy called Peanut. He's asleep down here over my shoulder. <laughs> okay, Lee, what else you got? You mean like other challenges I've experienced? Um, well, and I think my other main one was I had an episode of burnout. Mm. Um, and that was a surprise. I did not see that coming. <laughs> um, I think I, I went through a period where I was working with an organization that was giving me plenty of opportunity financially. It was very well paid. Um, But I was doing work that wasn't the work I loved. And it was moving me further and further away as time went on from from psychology and from doing that. Even little things like they asked me to take off my LinkedIn profile. Um, And I think it just, that part of my identity started to kind of get chipped away. And at the time, I didn't think it bothered me that much because I thought I just need to get through this bit and then it'll be better. I need to go fell into that really crappy mindset. Once, once it, we once we achieve this, it'll be better. Once we do this, it'll be better. Once we grow to this point, it'll be better. Um, and it wasn't better. And I think um, I think I'd started to realize that this work just wasn't bringing me joy, and I was finding it really hard and very stressful. And I think, but in a different way to like the the stress I experienced previously, it was almost like it was, it was turning me down. It was turning my voice down. It was turning my light down. It was just, I had to be a different version of myself. I had to, yeah, just, just dim myself really. Um, and then I think, and I didn't really notice. I knew I was tired. I knew that I was, I did start to feel like, like think that kind of dread of going to work um so I definitely felt the exhaustion side of it I was I was starting to feel a, a detachment of it. I was I was starting to lose my confidence in terms of of what I was able to do um but my breakthrough symptom of burnout was the cynicism and I remember sat with Al in Gdansk in Poland a beautiful food market with a glass of wine on a Sunday um and as we did many times you know we have a ridiculous life you know Al would say you know where do you want to where do you want to go next month? Where do you want to live? What do you see the rest of this year being like? Um, and I remember just being so freaking angry. And I just saying to Al, like, how dare you ask me to dream right now? I'm just trying to get through a day at a time. I don't need that on a Sunday as you chirping on my ear about all these other things that I'm going to have to do. But I'm just trying to get through, get through the week. Um, and it was like an out of body experience. where I looked down at myself and just thought, who are you? Who are you? I don't even like you right now. Um, and Al quite rightly put me in my place. It's funny you said you didn't see it coming and I did. Really? Yeah, I could see it. What would you have liked me to have done, which I didn't do, seeing that I saw the burnout was coming? I didn't know what it was because I didn't really know what burnout was then, but I knew there was something coming down the pipe. I didn't know what to do about it. What would you have wanted me to do about it? Do you know, I've I, I talked to Sally Clark about this, who's on the podcast a few episodes ago. Um, There's a really great webinar with her coming up, actually, which we'll keep you posted on. Um, I remember talking to Sally about this, and she was kind of like, when when I was at my, at my like, before breaking point, you couldn't have said anything to me. Right. Couldn't have said anything to me. I was doing what I had to do. I was hustling. I was working. I was strong. I was independent. There's not really anything that you could have said. Well, she said, you know, there's nothing you could have said to me. And I feel the same. I'm not sure there's anything you could have said to me. Um, that would have necessarily jolted me out of it. I think I think you handled it really well. You listened, you were there, you let me talk, you let me vent. You never told me what to do because that would have just annoyed me. Because I think that's the thing, isn't it? When you're we starting to experience symptoms of burnout, you feel this loss of control. And I think if somebody else would have told me I was losing control, that again, that anger would have kicked in. And I think that for me was a breakthrough because it was, of all the things to lose in this world jobs come and go like you say money come and go comes and goes the thought of and I know it was never I I knew 
guess deep down it was it was not necessarily a reality that you'd leave me but even just that that sense of i'm pushing you away right. that for me jolted me out of it i think and i think within a couple of weeks i quit my job and then the pandemic happened great timing leah <laughs> the thing to bear in mind i think if you are somebody who is who is with somebody who or living with somebody who is experiencing stress or depression or anxiety or possibly symptoms of burnout is it's not you like this person will probably start to touch and withdraw and be quiet and it's not you and I think as hard as it is my only advice would be to just try and keep talking to them try and keep creating a a non-judgmental environment for them so that they can talk about how they're feeling give them opportunities to vent continue to ask them to to go for dinner or or go for walks or you just need somebody even if they can't they can't break down the wall just popping their head over it and going you all right yeah and i think that would be the hardest thing is if people walked away but then of course with any scenario like that as well you know they, they can escalate they can escalate to things of distress and despair and, and suicidal thoughts it can escalate to significant substance abuse so of course if those things are happening then yeah you probably do need to to take more action and try and get people to even go and see their gp or you know something like that talk to your gp about it i know that's really hard these days but it's it's since been coined moral burnout where right. it's kind of triggered by a sense that your identity and your values are misaligned with the organization you're working for and i think that's definitely where where my source of it came from um, rather than necessarily the overworked, overwhelmed. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting thing if anyone is is struggling, which is why you know, which is why I love the Gen Gen Z talking about values and making sure they're aligned from early on in their career, damn straight. Because if they don't, you then you end up like me, kids. Um, but yeah, how about you, Al? Is there anything else that you've experienced in your life that that you want to share that you feel that like you've learned from? Yeah, I think that some of the lowest moments in my life have always been, and I was thinking about this a lot yesterday and also today when I was out with the dog thinking, is there a commonality? And I think there is. And I think it's down to comparison. And I think my lowest points have always been what I've been comparing myself to other people. And I was thinking about this, like, um, you know, if someone goes to a therapist or someone is unhappy or... So, it all seems to stem from this idea that they are lacking something. And that the lack can only come from comparing yourself to other people who don't have that. So if I, I, I want to, if I wanted to compare myself to the guy who's just run the two, two hour marathon, you know, first of all, he's half my age. Secondly, he's half my weight. <laughs> Thirdly, he's been running for all his life and I've done it three times in PE when I was 11. Um, so, you know, I could in theory go, Oh my God, I am so unfit. There's no, but there's, that doesn't seem, that seems silly. You need some tension if you want to improve. But I was thinking that rather than comparing yourself to someone else, compare yourself to maybe you yesterday or last week or 12 months ago. And that way, as long as you're growing and as long as you're getting better and better each single week, day, month, whatever, you've got something to compare yourself to. So you've got a tension. But you also feel good about that comparison because generally, most years, you get better. I mean, this whole idea of comparison, someone called it comparison is the thief of joy. Um, I, I read this thing once and it said, most people buy things they don't want with money they don't have to impress people they don't even like. And that sums up the whole of the UK for me. Using this juxtaposition of the UK where everyone's like, oh, your car's three years old. Oh, can you not afford a new one? banter banter you should be wearing a new car compared to maybe places like spain uh, like bosnia where we are now the places that seem the happiest weirdly don't have identifying years in their number plates so you can't tell if your car is five years old or 10 years old or 15 years old apart from knowing what the model's like if yes compare yourself to who you want to be and who you have been but stop comparing yourself to others because there's always someone out there with a bigger cigar. Yeah, I think the pursuit of stuff is is a bit challenging, isn't it? When you are from the UK, or I'm sure it's the same in, in North America as well, Australia. Um, and I think that is something that we, we, we seem to learn as we get older, I think, whether you're having a family or you start to experience other things or you start to experience loss and it puts things into perspective. But I think if you're a younger person listening who... 
I guess gets their maybe think that's where their, their sense of self worth will come from or confidence will come mm. from or I think yeah I think that's a that's a challenging mindset to be in and, and you know particularly you know we think about about financial well being and the challenges people are having by far our most downloaded episode of the podcast history mm. was that episode with with Kara Cooper and Ryan and Kushbu. Um, that was talking about financial. That was talking about financial well-being, yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, I think it's tr- it's tough, isn't it? I think there's also this point of again a point of privilege where you know finding roles that will make you um, experience purpose and meaning is much easier to do when you've got you know a low mortgage on a three bed house in the part of the world that you want to live and you go on holiday twice a year. And I think, yeah, there is a sense of that. But I think if for younger people listening, like this is a, I think just be mindful that that association between stuff and happiness probably isn't real. Mm-hmm. And I think one day there will something will happen that will teach you that lesson and probably in a harsh way. So I think there's work that you can do to think about the things that bring you joy um, and think about more experiences or people or hobbies or, you know, there is nothing more joyful to me then sitting down on a Saturday morning with a cup of tea and watching James Martin having like a bit of brunch, whether that be a bacon butty or something fancy like avocado on toast. Like it's just, that brings me joy of a Saturday morning. Walking out with Peanut and seeing his stupid little face like bounding towards me as he was running, that brings me joy. Um, being near water, like sitting in a cafe and and seeing a river or next to the beach or that gives me a sense of peace. That gives me joy. Doing my skincare routine brings me joy. There's so many different things and and these these things that are acts of self care and self compassion that really do make a difference to our our mental health. And it's not there might be time to time that it's a bit about stuff, um, but most of the time it's actually about ritual and experience and. And that type of thing. So yeah, sorry, I got off on a rant there. No, it's all right. I want to come back to that for my final point, which is only only a very quick Please one. Please do. So no, what what have you got? No, <laughs> no, Leanne. <laughs> um, what else do I have? I think the only thing that I have noticed when you you were saying about, and I've I've thought about this before actually the last couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm. it's been a busy it's been a bit a busy few weeks here in Podcast HQ for various reasons, including our brand new. Um, video podcast producer who you um, will meet very soon it's been a busy time it's been a busy few months we've been moving around quite a bit this summer I was thinking back to when I was my most when I felt my most kind of grounded my most centered my most healthy I guess um, and it was probably the year it was probably 2021 into 2022 um, and that I think lockdown the, yeah like the end of lockdown and then coming out of it right um, but I think I got really into a routine of exercising and particularly in terms of like strength training or Pilates type stuff. And I was reflecting on this because I would never like do the cardio stuff and I'd be like, oh, and you get into it and you feel great afterwards. But it never shifted for me from like a going into it and thinking, oh, God. Um, whereas with the kind of the weight training stuff or the resistance training, I really enjoyed it and I couldn't wait to do it. And I've been reflecting on this and I think it's because it gave me a sense of control. Right. Like I was literally in control of the movements I was making. I was mindful of that control. And I think for anybody who suffers with anxiety, it's often that lack of control and the unknown um, that's always with you. And I think for me, that really helped to exercise my sense of control. Um, and I miss that. And I, yeah, that's my, once we get Mad World done this week, that's going to be my new thing on the run up to Christmas is get back into that, that routine. Um I just yeah I just felt like that was my most balanced I've been for a long while and I don't think doing what you're saying you know just try and be a better version of, of the person than you were last year I think I am a better version in in many ways and probably more work related ways um but in terms of that side of managing my mental health and that side of self-care that has slipped for me um so that's something I want to I want to focus on because I know mentally I've been in a better place and I, I know how to get back there again. So I need to just put in the work. Well, there we go. We're on target for 50,000 50, uh, listeners this month. So you've just told 50,000 people. <laughs> so you, you've got to go ahead and do it right now. I will. So my final one is around this universal idea of money. 
And I think that money makes people so unhappy. There's something which changed for us about oh, probably about two years ago. We were in Croatia in a little uh, village called Imotski. And what's cool about living in particularly the Balkans, but a lot of Europe is, and if you live out in the countryside, is that you don't, you kind of find people who don't have a great deal or don't appear to have a great deal, but still like will give you a lovely smile in the morning and say hello and, um, you know, and, and so that kind of like helps you to stop thinking about, I need a new car because this person's perfectly happy and they've got no car. They've got a donkey. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that kind of like was getting us down this road. And then we went to this, um, to this winery and the owner of the winery, well, he was the son of the owner of the winery. Um, and uh, he kind of was a bit grumpy when we turned up because he's like English, bloody hell, I'm going to speak English to them. Uh, but after a little while, he joined us and he was bringing out all these wines. We were drinking them all together. And I think we're all getting a little bit merry. And he remember he stopped and he went, I don't, I'm not a millionaire, but I live a millionaire lifestyle. As he said, as we sat at the edges of his vines with all his grapes going off into the distance, the sun was just setting over, this, over the, the hills. We were drinking this amazing white wine that he'd made himself. Um, and he just, and that just stuck with us. And so one of the things I kind of want to say to anyone who's like, right, there's, there's going to be a level of money that you need. And yes, to subsist, of course there will be. And if you're not at that level, then, you know, uh, Godspeed, I hope you get there as soon as you possibly can. But once you get to a point where you're like, okay, I've got a working car if I need one, I've got enough food and I can go for a walk in the evening. Money is great up until a point where you can subsist. And thereafter, it's okay not to not to chase it. For those people, the Elon Musks of the world, money is, is, is the, the game is making money and money is how you keep, can keep score. That's it. Leanne said a couple of weeks ago that, the, I think it was the financial uh, well-being episode, is that the stats show that people who've, who earn 20,000 or less or 80,000 or more, now, hang on. What what the stats, Lee? Because they were really good. Yeah, yeah. No, it's basically that. Yeah, less than less than twenty thousand, or more than I think it was actually a bit less. I think it's more than sixty, had higher instances of depression, anxiety, struggles with mental health. Um, so yeah, money, and I think we talked about it as well in terms of the psychology of happiness episode. Yeah, there is a correlation between between happiness or good mood, um, and money up to about. And I think again, that was lower. I think that was 50,000 a yeah. year. And, and after that, it doesn't make much difference. So I was right. You need, you need a certain amount of money to, to be comfortable, to live, to not experience stress from, from lack. Um, but yeah, money, money will not make you happy. And the science has proven that time and time again, you know, that longitudinal study, what's the one thing that, that keeps us going healthier, happier and longer it's relationships. Mm -hmm. That is the one thing. And that is, and this is going to sound really harsh, but really kind of assessing the quality of your relationships and what are they bringing you? I have been friends with people in the past who aren't in my life anymore, who were very materialistic, very mm -hmm. driven in that way. And very, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't getting to these, these, this stuffs, then you weren't being successful. Um, so I think, yeah, I think particularly if you're a young person or I think, you know, just that if are there people around you saying that you can't do things, the people around you trying to limit your potential, your capability, you know, how dare you dream that big? Who do you think you are? And of course, I'm not saying cut these people out of your life because that might be your parents. It could be your siblings. It could be, um, you know, people you've known for, for years and years and years. But maybe just look at diversifying those relationships. Are there ways to surround yourself with people that may be will dream big with you that will you know push the limit of things and I think that's a you know we still have amazing friends back in in the UK but we've also made amazing friends who we felt very very close to very very quickly because they lived a similar lifestyle they've been traveling or they lived abroad in and they they just get it in a way that other people can't because they understand the challenges and the sacrifice and the the downside and then the huge upsides and the a huge roller coaster journey you go on from extreme joy to extreme sadness often living this life mm -hmm. and i think it's yeah if you're if there's a way to diversify those relationships if you're feeling that there's not somebody who's in your corner who you'll ride and die and if you don't have at least two then i think you yeah maybe look at that whether it's joining it a hobby group or even something you know some groups online like entrepreneurship groups or, or that type of thing um yeah i'm probably laboring the point at this point but what is it you said who said it the five people thing 
Oh, I, I heard it was Jim Rohn, but it was probably someone before that saying you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And I think that is your, that 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 alludes to the, exactly what you're talking about there with the relationships. Um, and if the five people you spend time with, they're all like, oh, look at them, they're filthy rich. And, oh, it's not fair that Elon Musk makes all this money. He should be giving all of it back to, to us. And, and, you know, that's just a lack mindset. You're comparing yourself to someone who's got a lot of money and going, I want some of it. Whereas if you, if you make sure you surround yourself with people who are genuinely happy, who do things that make them happy, not that they think make them look good in other people's eyes, I think you're onto a winner. Yeah. And you know what? Volunteering is a really good way to find those types of people as well. People whose values align with your own and have that that same those yeah, that same vision or purpose or beliefs or a way they want the world to be. Um so yeah, if you are feeling a bit of a lack there or you're starting to think, Oh, do you know what? Maybe, maybe I do need some to diversify my relationships a bit. That'd be my advice. Look at look at volunteering is a really, a really great way of doing that. Absolutely. So should we quickly summarize our points then? Yeah, I don't, I've not really kept track of my points. I think, yeah, I think that, you know, I remember having a conversation, I won't say who, um, but I think they listened to the podcast and they might remember. And I remember I wasn't hugely open about my anxiety when it started, um, but I started to share more as I got more comfortable with it, and which is also important if you're able to. Um, and this person said to me, you never struck me as the type of person that would suffer from anxiety. Mm. You seem so controlled and together and and decisive and you know you like to take risks and 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 you're a psychologist um yeah even people who you might think have got their shit together (laughs) chances are they would have experienced something at some point they might well be experiencing that right now and and be very good at masking it i saw something else that was like if um i think it's a summarizing my point of, of kind of you know you never really know and mental health happens to everyone and anyone. Mental health doesn't discriminate. Um, or poor mental health doesn't discriminate. You may think, I never would have known you suffer with anxiety. I had no idea that was an experience for you because you put to, you put yourself so together in the world. That being a, high, a person with high functioning anxiety, that makes it easier for the people around me to deal with my anxiety. It doesn't make it easier for me. It can happen to anyone. It does happen to anyone. It's much more common than you will ever realise. And yeah, you're not, you're really not alone with it. Poor mental health and poor and low self-worth is probably one of the major reasons why your work, Karen, is like Karen. Why your boss, if you've got a bad boss and they won't let you do certain things, why that friend is always just a bit weird with you. It's all down to probably lack of self-worth comparing themselves to others and resulting in poor mental health and so when you start to think about that you realize that actually you're right it's a lot more common you think and actually i think good for the gen z's and the millennials for making us talk about this Mm. us gen x and the generation above me the boomers we didn't we wouldn't dare say that we were struggling with mental health because then we'd be called the lunars and the loonies and you wouldn't know, get that promotion. You wouldn't get, oh, no, he's no, a, bit, no. a bit unstable, Al. Yeah, a bit unstable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, and that is why, you know, I, I know I say it with Jess, but I, I mean it sincerely. I love the conversations that are happening with Gen Z and the younger millennials, and I'm I'm excited for this shift because it's, and you know what, it might, it might feel a bit uncomfortable to us older people, and it might feel a bit snowflakey or a bit overact, but the point is it's, we need that, radical change of conversation to have an impact on mental health services all right the conversation has changed but the access to support and care hasn't changed the inequity in that hasn't changed the only thing that's changed is people being more comfortable to talk about it we now have a bit more of a vocabulary to talk about these things but we need to shout that loud until that change actually happens at a systemic level at an organizational level at a healthcare level that people get access to the to the support that they need in times of crisis but also in terms of you know prevention how do we build ourselves from surviving to thriving as we talked to to louise from business in the community a few a few months ago if you're feeling skeptical or cynical one are you okay you might be experiencing burnout i've been there it's not easy to spot um but if these conversations you know are are kind of giving you a bit of an eye roll. I I will give you permission for that eye roll when these conversations are happening and people have equitable access to mental health care services. Until that happens, we need to keep shouting about it. 
We, the majority of people, if you're listening to this on a mobile phone, then you're probably quite privileged because you've got access to the internet, you've got access to a, a smartphone. Um, so you're already in the top maybe 10, 15, 20, 30% of the population. So that brings me on to my other one about comparing yourself to others. Um, it's good for growth. You need some tension. You can't, you know, don't down compare to others by going, oh, I'm better than them. But also don't do the other thing of saying, well, they're so much better than me and that's why my life is rubbish. You can live a millionaire lifestyle without being a millionaire. Just be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Yeah, and I think my final my final thought would be if you are struggling in a minute, if you are feeling in distress or despair or hopeless or feelings of suicide, there are people that you can talk to and we will leave phone numbers and links in the show notes for you. You might feel very alone in this moment, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you are currently experiencing a crisis, we will leave some things in the show notes that that can help or you can always drop Al and I an email and we will do what we can to to point you in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, the Samaritans of the UK has an email service, um, so you don't even need to call them. Um, so, and, you know, if that would be easy, if you're outside the UK and you don't have access to that or you don't know where the equipment is, that's, that's a possibility. So a little bit of a somber one, but I feel that an important one that we needed to say, because mm -hmm. like we said, I'm not saying for any second that we are influencers, but people could look at us and go, oh, look at these guys with a podcast and living abroad and all this kind of stuff. And we wanted just to be really honest and go, look, it, it ain't all sunshine and rainbows. Yeah, honest talk, what it's like, our own experiences, and also that, you know, mental health is something that we have invested in for ourselves and to try and support other people for a long time for how long 15 years probably mm -hmm. and counting mm -hmm. uh, we're not just some some weirdos that just came up and were like hey we're going to talk to you about mental health and well-being um yeah we've lived this for for a little while so hopefully you've learned a bit more about about us our experiences hopefully we have given you some positive comparisons if you are struggling that doesn't mean that other things can't work out or it will all be okay in the end or it will just be a part of your life that sits with you my anxiety sits with me I know she's always there um sometimes she's bigger sometimes she's smaller um but yeah she's she's a part of me and she's all right just keep her in keep her in check and if anything's resonated with you and you want to get in touch our emails will be on the show notes we'd love to hear from you love hearing from listeners so yeah. please let us know and um i hope you're okay and i hope you're having having a good day and we'll see you next week for perhaps a little chirpier in nature but an equally important message yes absolutely next week we will be bringing you all the gossip from the mad world summit the sixth mad world summit that's happening in london uh, this week um so yeah if we if we saw you there if we if we're gonna see that if we'll see that this gets released on thursday if you're listening to this and you're at the mad world summit come and see us that's us yeah that's us yeah that's us um, but yeah we're bringing you the inside scoop on what is set to be an incredible incredible event so yeah we will see you next week yep registration link is in the show notes bye bye bye